Hi all. So, <coughs> welcome to another lecture on EC469 Opto Electronic Devices. We are going to start module number 5 which is basically regarding photo detectors. So, in this lecture we are going to understand the concepts of photo detection, how what photo detection is going to happen and what is the what are the process involved in detecting a photon and how is it detected and we will understand the structure and working of pin diode pin diode and avalanche photodiode for photo detection so <coughs> there are three processes involved in photo detection first one is the absorption of optical energy and generation of carriers. So we know that if you have a semiconductor or even if you have a PN junction of semiconductor, it will form a depletion region when it, it is reversed by us the depletion region will be of longer width and when a photon is incident on a depletion region or on the material it will generate the and the, if the photon of is of considerable energy greater than the band gap then the electron in the valence band will absorb this energy and move to the conduction band basically which means that it will get split into a hole and an electron and since it is an applied field the hole and the electron will move in opposite directions so which in turn will produce the current so the electron will move uh, to this direction and the hole will move into this direction which will finally constitute the photo current okay we will see it in, de in detail and then the, there is a transportation of photo generated carriers across the absorption and or transit region with or without gain. So just like I said earlier, the ca carriers generated will move to the external circuit via the semiconductor constituting the photo current. Carrier collection and generation of photo current means that once it is available in the external circuit it will constitute the current now it can be classified into two one is intrinsic intrinsic which detects light of wavelength close to band gap another is extrinsic which detects light of wavelength less than band gap so we will see using a figure just like in this one as you see that when a photon of energy eg which is greater than this band gap energy is incident the electron in the valence band will absorb the photon move to the conduction band and once it's in the conduction band it actually constitutes the current this is actually the intrinsic version of the photo detector now in extrinsic version there is a uh, energy level in the band gap because of some impurities or because of some defects and these are called as deep levels this is like a deep level and even the electrons or holes in a deep level can absorb the photon of energy less than that of band gap energy it can move towards the conduction band and once it is in the conduction band, it is free for the electrons and it can move. Now, the cu current which constitutes the photon current need not only because of electron, it can also be because of hole. Okay, so holes in the valence band. So, as an electron moves to the upper level, there will be a hole available in the valence band which also can constitute the current. Now, there is a third, this is actually the extrinsic version of. The photo detector where you have an extra level in the band gap which constitutes the current now there is a third version using the quantum well so in the quantum well we have studied that if the quantum well is very narrow means the width is very small 
then there is a substantial energy difference between two sub bands so if a photon of energy less than eg but of energy greater than this energy difference is incident the electron can absorb the energy and move to a higher sub band now higher sub band has less amount of quantum depth so that it can easily jump and conduct the electricity so this are the three ways in which the photo detection can happen and all the three ways includes that the photo energy will be absorbed the electron will move to the higher energy state by separating it itself from the photon and it will go to the external circuit constituting the photo current now we need to know how much efficient is our photo detector and we have a term called as external quantum efficiency which gives you the ratio of the number of electrons or number of electrons which constitutes a photo current to the number of photons incident IPH is the photo current and photo current is the rate of change of charges okay so if IPH by if you do IPH by Q which basically gives the number of electrons in IPH P incident is the incident power of the incident uh, photons and the which new is the energy of one photon so when you divide the incident photons by one energy of one photon it basically gives you the number of photons so external efficiency means for each photon generate each photon how many number of electrons are constituting the current now ideally speaking the external efficiency should be one because for each photon incident it can be absorbed by one electron and it can constitute the current but it is not always the case sometimes the photon incident might not be of enough energy to make the electron move to the conduction by in that case it will not be absorbed so there is also called as an internal quantum efficiency eta i it is actually the ratio of number of pairs of electron hole created to the number of photons absorbed again ideally internal quantum efficiency should be one but not all photons absorbed will create the electron hole pairs and there is responsivity which is basically instead of taking the ratio of number of photons to number of sorry number of electrons to number of photons instead we take the ratio of the current which is generated to the incident power and this can be in general given as n lambda by 1.24 so all the most of or all the photo detectors constitute something called as a junction photodiode now there should there will, the junction photodiode will have a p region n region and there will be a depletion region now the depletion region can be of can be formed by because of pn pn n region or it can be a separate region for example in pin diode it is an intrinsic region but whatever be the case when you apply a reverse bias to the semiconductor a depletion region will be formed between pn and region so in this case is an n minus region and all the field will be applied on to this depletion region so you can see that the field across p is zero across n is zero but across this depletion region you have a field varying from high to low now because of this field variation whatever carriers generated inside this depletion region will be swept away across the junction towards the other side for example since it is a reverse biased pn junction if an electron is generated 
since there is a positive charge here the electron will be swept away from the depletion region towards the end region and it will be flown out of the semiconductor if the electron is not absorbed in the n plus region so if there are sufficiently large number of electrons generated it will be flown out of the depletion region towards the external circuitry constituting the current similarly the holes which are generated so every photon incident will always generate an electron hole pair so for every electron there is a hole generated so for every hole generated the hole again will be swept away out of the depletion region it will move to the p plus region if it doesn't combine in p plus region because of the minority carrier combination then it will move out of the circuit constituting the photo current okay and you see that in this diagram depending on the intensity of the light the current since it is a reverse biased semiconductor we consider the third quadrant where the current is negative and the voltage is also negative so in this quadrant we see that depending on the intensity of the light you can have different levels of current and whatever is there in the positive and positive of current and voltage it is called as a dark current which is basically a noise which is not desirable okay now the important thing to note here is that the width of this depletion region which we will say let's say w let's say i incident a pn junction photodiode with some, a light of something like this okay so in this case you see that there is a some frequency for the light now ideally when you convert this light to current your current should also vary in the same way so that we can dictate that light intensity okay now if the light frequency of very high very low value which means this transition times are very less then you can always have the current also in the same way now when the frequency is increased then the problem that can happen is when the light goes from low to high means a photon and an electron is created and now the photon and electron should move out and go to the external circuitry to have this current okay now because of the width of this depletion region and many other factors of the pn junction the electrons and holes generated will take a finite amount of time to go to this okay the time the electron and hole takes to move across the depletion region towards the external circuitry is called as a transit time now if the transit time is very high in that case then the final current output will not be of this form but it can have of something like this okay so if it gets something like this then you might not be able to detect the light as it is incident because the electron and hole will take some finite amount of transit time to reach the external circuit to constitute the current so before it reaches the external circuit the next intensity of light might al already come okay and we cannot detect the correct way so the bandwidth or the switching frequency of the photodiode will impact will gets impacted because of the transit time effect so we need ideally to have electron and holes of high mobility where it can uh, where it can move fast and out of the depletion region to external circuit or we should have the width as low as possible 
Now, the problem with width making low is that when the width is made low, the area of this is small implies the amount of area that the photon gets incident will be less so that only very very less number of photons will be incident. Okay, so all these have an effect on the output. So depending on your application whether you need a high switching bandwidth device or whether you need to have absorb maximum photons you need to adjust the width of the depletion region. Now the most commonly used photo detector is the pin diode where I means intrinsic. So you have a P plus area, you have an N plus area and there is an area of intrinsic. Now when, when you work with this you create a reverse bias connected to this pin diode. So when you, up, when you have this reverse bias voltage, the complete electric field is applied across the intrinsic part as you can see from here. The complete electric field is in the intrinsic part. So as you, as the photon is incident and hole and electron pair is created, the electron will move across so if it is incident in the I, it will move across the junction towards the other side. If the hole is created, it will move across the junction towards the other side. And there will not be any electron hole pairs in the I region because there is a huge electric field which will make sure that it will be swept away across the junction and it will go out to the external circuit. Now this constitutes the current and depending on the intensity of the light you will have you will, you will generate more number of electrons and holes which makes the amount of photo current higher and this is the basic working. Now regarding the construction of pin diode you see that there is an intrinsic region okay there is a p plus region because of indium gallium alum, indium aluminium arsenide there is an n plus region by indium gallium arsenide and the substrate is indium phosphide okay now there are two ways of allowing the light to enter the first way is where there is small portion between the contacts okay so this is an contact through which you are going to provide the reverse bias and there is a small portion between the contact along which you can give the light that is one way the other way is this is the same material or this is the same structure instead of giving light from the between the contacts instead you create a curve in the substrate and the light is provided from the from the curved portion so there are two ways so in the first part you are giving showing light on the p plus region and the second part you are showing light on the substrate okay so this is aluminium based and this is indium based so in the pin diode as always in any type of diode there are two types of current which is possible one is drift current and another is diffusion current so drift current is mainly because of the electric field and diffusion current is mainly because of the concentration of the carrier in both the regions of the across all, uh, both the regions of the junction okay so jdr and jdf is the current density current per unit area of the junction okay now we have an expression for diffusion and drift current so drift current depends on the charge there is a term called as phi zero which is the incident photon flux x this is photons per second per centimeter square into 
1 minus e raised to minus alpha is the absorption coefficient multiplied by the width of the layer. So, this will constitute a drift current. So, depending on the photon incident, the number of photon incident per second per unit area and depending on how much photon it is absorbed by which is given by the absorption coefficient and depending on what is the transit time dependence on the width, you will have the drift current. Similarly, you have a diffusion current density which is the derivation is much more complicated. Here you have apart from this phi 0 and alpha w etc. So, this w should be at the top. So, this should be e raised to minus alpha w. Apart from this uh, phi 0 alpha and w, there is a term which is called as LH and DH. So, LH is root over DH by into tau h where dh is a diffusion coefficient for holes and tau h is the carrier lifetime of holes. So, this also gives you the diffusion current density like instead of the effect of electric field instead because of the concentration of the charge carriers the holes or electrons in both the regions it can move across the junction to constitute the current. Now, if you come to frequency response as we have said earlier, the frequency depends on the transit time. So, if the width is small, then the transit time of electrons and holes are low or it will take a lesser amount, amount of time because of which it can respond to fast changes in light. So, that is what is here. If the photodiode is designed to be sufficiently small with desired responsivity, then the transit time effects of its carrier determines its bandwidth or frequency response. The photo generated carriers require finite time to traverse the repletion layer which is referred to as transit time. This we have already discussed. If the photon excitation is modulated at high frequency, then there creates a phase difference between the photon flux and photo current. Okay, so, what this means is, <coughs> let us say your incident light is of this form okay. and this is of very high frequency, let us say in gigahertz or something. Now, ideally speaking, your output current also should follow exactly what is there in the incident light like this. Instead, the current might follow something like this. So, what it means is there is a phase difference between the incident and incident light and the current. Okay. This happens usually at very high frequencies. The response frequency response is given by this equation again this is a complicated derivation but just to give you a picture of how the frequency response looks like it is like this and again here you see that there is phi 0 alpha and w and there is an extra term which is omega into T r h. This is actually T suffix T r h is the transit time of holes. And T suffix T r e is the transit time of electrons. Okay. So, this is how the frequency response is modeled and equivalent to this there is a circuit. So, this is an equivalent circuit for frequency response. Where you have this current, now there is a shunt resistance or it is the combination of all shunt resistance. There is a series resistance. or it is a combination of all series resistance in the material, there is a load resistance and there is a series inductance, a combination of all inductance in series. There is a junction capacitance 
which is a property of any kind of semiconductor then there is a parasitic capacitance and you can determine values of all of this depending on the material so i think this is for indian gallium arsenide so here you can model the pin photodiode using all these circuit parameters this is for analyzing the frequency response and you can create a transfer function for pn junction pin diode photodiode to uh, understand more of its effect and you can see the frequency response of this one and the frequency response is in omega tre because in the expression everything is in omega tr e or omega tr ttrh okay so frequency response is always in that form and you can see the response magnitude so this basically at lower frequencies you have higher magnitude and for higher frequencies you have a lower magnitude so basically it's a high uh, low pass filter now we see that uh, there is something called a dark current in our uh, uh semiconductor so we are going to analyze this noise performance so when you have this semiconductor without any light incident p n and i it still has some current which is flowing there is no light and there still has some current and this is called as a dark current and dark current is a noise because ideally speaking when you incident light for example let's say you are showing light of some particular intensity then your current should also have a value depending on this intensity for example if you are shining light of let's say 1 lumen then your current should be like 1 microamps ideally but because of this dark current the current can change to something different something like 1.2 microamps this 0.2 microamps is actually a noise okay so this is one such noise is the dark current so the pin photodiode or any junction photodiode operates under reverse bias condition where dark current is very small usually the dark current is very small therefore the short noise which is developed by only by generation within depletion region is very small okay in these devices the resistance or johnson noise play the dominant role and even this can be minimized by optimizing the current parameters now the because of this intrinsic part there's a resistance resistance associated with it okay and this will constitute the extra noise in the form of a current it's called as a johnson noise okay we will see the expression all all this so the mean square johnson current is given by this expression where r equivalent is the pre equivalent resistance of rd rs and rl which we have seen in the previous circuit knt knt b etc are the normal components b bandwidth t is temperature k is boltzmann's constant this is the noise current now apart from this dark current which we have stated earlier there can be a current because of the background light now whenever you do have this photodiode this might not be kept in completely light free region like there will be some kind of light in and around okay and this will constitute as some kind of a current and this is given as ib so the equivalent mean square short mean square short noise is given by this expression where b is the bandwidth IPH is the photon current, Q is the charge, IB and ID are the current, ambient current and the dark current. So this is the effective uh, mean square short noise current. So if you can, if you want to look at the equivalent circuit, so this is the ID current. This is the photodiode is in reverse bias. There is a photo excitation where in which you provide a light. but there is also some amount of background radiation which will constitute ib and there is an id because of the dark current and finally you will have iph in the equivalent circuit of the noise is given as this where all the parameters we have already explained and we have extra 
two currents i j and i s and the r equivalent which is mentioned in uh, the in, in the r equivalent of all these resistances are given by this expression now for the diode the signal to noise power is very important because if the signal s and r the signal to noise ratio is very less than 1 implies you can't detect the signal which is in this case the correct light in if you need to detect the signal the sonar should be as high as possible so in the signal to noise ratio the numerator part is the signal power as you can see from the expression this is p incident divided by h nu which will be number of photons into eta which is give the efficiency into q which is the number of charges so the signal power so number of photons into efficiency into charge will give you the total net output current the square of that will will give you the power and the denominator is actually the noise this term we have already seen and this term is the Johnson's noise and the left part of the term is the noise because of ambient current and the dark current so this is a signal to noise ratio that is on the P and L. Now, you ideally should have signal to noise ratio more than one. So, there is a cutoff or there is a threshold above which we should consider signal to noise ratio and it is, we have something called as noise equivalent power. It is defined as the signal power that gives signal to noise ratio of one for one hertz output band. Okay. So, noise equivalent power is if you make signal to noise ratio is equal to 1 with bandwidth is equal to 1, what should be the signal power? That is equal to the noise equivalent power and if you substitute in this expression this is equal to 1 and B is also equal to 1. then you can find out what should be this expression that is given by this. So, noise equivalent power is an important term where you say that okay if the noise equivalent power is less that means your signal does not have enough power to give or to detect the signal at the output. Next we are going to look at avalanche photodiode. So, why we want to use avalanche photodiode is the pin diode does not give a too much of a gain like maybe for one photon which is uh, incident it will might give one electron as output. Now if you want to detect very very feeble light then for each photon incident you need to create large amount of current otherwise it might not have enough current to be detected even in the ammeter. So, to do that we need to have the gain and the gain is obtained using avalanche photodiode. So, for many applications where very low levels of light are to be detected, it is desirable to use a detector with large sensitivity and that requires a large optical gain and large gains can be obtained in avalanche photodiode. So, how is how does the avalanche photodiode works? So, APD is an essentially a reverse bias pin junction that is operated at voltage close to the breakdown voltage. You know that for any diode there is something called as a breakdown voltage and beyond the breakdown voltage there is an avalanche scenario happening in the diode. An avalanche photodiode or APD will work very near to this breakdown voltage in reverse bias condition. The photo generator carriers in the depletion region travel at their saturation velocities and if they acquire enough energy from the field during such transit and ionizing collision with the lattice can occur. Now we know that usually the photodiode will have the depletion region and uh, the P and N junction. Now when a light is shown in the 
PN junction which is having applied with a heavy voltage. An electron and hole is created. The electron will travel towards the positive part of the electric field and hole will towards negative part of the electric field. Now when it travels it will hit other atoms in the depletion region creating again an electron and a hole. The new newly created electrons and holes will hit other atoms again creating new electron and hole. So it keeps on multiplying like an avalanche and finally when it comes out of the material towards the external circuit you will have a heavy current. So the primary electron and hole are the ones which is created by the photon and the secondary electrons or the holes or charge carriers are the one created by bombarded, bombarding with the primary carriers. So the secondary electron hole pairs are produced in the process which again drifts in opposite directions together with the primary carrier and all or some of them may produce new carriers. So primary carriers will hit the secondary carriers, it will produce this electron and hole which will again hit another electron and hole and cause on. And this process is known as impact ionization which leads to carrier multiplication and gain. It's called as an impact ionization. So how uh, well you can how can we define the impact ionization more accurately? So let alpha E and alpha H are the impact ionization coefficients for electrons and holes. So we are going to term it quantitatively. So we are saying alpha E and alpha H are the impact ionization constants. The ionization co coefficients determine the rate of ionizing coll collisions. So if the if the higher the value, the larger the rate. If the ionization coefficients are high, means for each electron generated, it might get collided with multiple amount of electrons, creating large number of charge carriers. If they are low, one electron might hit another atom to create one electron, and, and it will get carried away. Okay, and they are defined as the average number of ionizing collisions per unit length. So, if you take a unit length of your region. If one electron can produce, let's say, two electrons, then you say the you say the alpha e is two. If it can produce three electrons, then it, you say the alpha e is three. So three electrons means first the electron will hit one atom, it will create a one electron. That electron will hit another atom, it will get another electron and goes on. Okay, till before it reaches the depletion region, reaches the external circuit. Avalanche multiplication noise is lowest in devices in which the avalanche process is initiated by the carrier with higher ionization rate. So always we need to have the carriers with higher ionization rate or a higher value for ionization coefficient. The value of alpha by alpha h should be as large so as small as possible or small as possible so that the recycling of carriers and depletion region is minimized. The device become faster. Now alpha e by alpha h should be very high or should be very low. If it is very high means alpha e is much much greater than alpha h. Okay, So in that case more number of electrons are produced. If alpha h tends to 0, sorry this direction tends to 0 then alpha h is much much greater than alpha e. In that case, more number of holes are produced. Now, what happens alpha e by alpha h is equal to 1? So, in that case, an equal number of holes and electrons are produced, and there is always a chance of recombination of holes and, holes and electrons. And this will cause our photo current to decrease because it is combined, it, it is not going to the external circuit. It might get combined in the depletion region itself, which is basically something called a recycling action and it will impact our output. So since the avalanche process takes time to build up, when the device exhibits gain, the bandwidth is reduced. So in pin diode, when you incident light, 
the electron hole pairs are created and it will just move out of the repletion region to the external circuit. But in avalanche photodiode, since there is an avalanche needs to happen, it will take a good amount of time to have that avalanche because for every charge carrier generated, it needs to generate multiple charge carriers. And this is a time consuming process. So, even though gain is high, the bandwidth is reduced means you might not be able to detect sudden changes in the light. It takes finite amount of time for ionizing collision to occur. Also if alpha by alpha h is equal to 1, both type of carriers continuously recycle and persist in the depletion region leading to a long response time and consequently a small bandwidth. So that we have already told. So if alpha e by alpha h is equal to 1, that means you have equal number of electrons and holes which in turn have a probability of combining again. In that case, it will not go to the external circuit which will reduce the current. The best case is which you have alpha by alpha which tends to 0 or tends to infinity, in which case the response is limited only by the duration of the single, single transit. So the response, response means how long it will take the photon incident after incident by the photon on depletion region how long will it take to generate a corresponding current so that is basically the response time and it will depend on the transit how long it will take for the electron to move from the depletion region to the external circuit so usually if alpha by alpha which h tends to infinity or zero transit time will be very less so this is an illustration of how the photodiode works. So there is an electric field, this is actually time. So for an electron created, it will it will hit another atom creating an electron and hole pair. The hole will move out, the electron will also move out. This is the condition when which alpha e by alpha h is, is equal to 1. So here depletion region boundary is this, the moving out can also be some kind of a combination also. Now again this hole will impact another atom creating another electron hole pair. This hole moves out, this electron hits another atom creating another electron hole pair and this electron moves out. So for every electron which is generated, you will have one extra one electron out and one hole out to the external circuit. But if you consider this for every electron created, it has two electrons which is moving out okay and for you can see this also although the hole is only one the electrons moving out is more so for every electron there are at least two more electrons which are going to the external circuit and this is the case where alpha e by alpha h tends to infinity now if you look at the noise now Again, the noise in avalanche photodiode is also because of the dark current and uh, dark current means again without any light shown there is some amount of current in the circuit which is dark current. So main uh, component of noise in avalanche photodiode is the dark current. So the overall noise performance of APD is determined by the short noise arising from the unmultiplied dark current and noise from the probabilistic avalanche process. So the avalanche process itself can create some unwanted current. Okay, So that can also create noise. There are random fluctuations in the actual distance between successive ionizing collisions. Okay? So ideally speaking, uh, you should have the collisions in equal intervals, but there will be fluctuations in that which will create a noise. These fluctuations give rise to variations in the total number of secondary carriers generated for each primary carrier injected in the gain region. So ideally speaking if alpha is equal to 2, so for every electron created by the photon, you need to have two more electrons generated which will constitute the current. Now because of this fluctuations, it might create lesser number of electrons or higher number of electrons and this will constitute a noise. This leads to randomness or noise in the total signal current 
and the magnitude of noise depends on the mean average gain. So this will create basically the noise. Now there is something called as ionization threshold energies. So in an avalanche photodiode, the process of impact ionization occurs in the high field depletion region that we have already stated. After ionization, the final carriers are left with finite kinetic energy and momentum. Now, when there is a collision occurs, so when an electron collides with an atom creating new electron and hole, there is some kind of a momentum which is getting shifted to this. So now there is a, a good amount of kinetic energy which is transferred to this new electron and new this hole. The energy of the impact ionizing primary carrier is greater than the band gap energy. Okay. So usually when you instead a photon creating an electron which essentially means the electron is absorbing the energy of the photon, it creates, it get, get, the electron will get an energy higher than the band gap and this band gap energy is being transferred or this higher energy is being transferred to the secondary carriers. The actual energy lost by the primary carrier is the threshold ionization energy. So once you transfer this kinetic energy, some amount of energy will be lost from the primary carrier and this is called as threshold ionization energy. So these are two pictures in which the ionization is caused by electron and other by hole. Okay. So you see that this is momentum and this is energy. So you see there is a change in momentum here because of which there is a change in momentum of the output. Here you see that there is no change in momentum. So the, uh, the secondary carriers will not have too much of momentum. Now the impact ionization coefficients alpha e and alpha h are the reciprocal of the average distance traveled by electrons and holes in the direction of the electric field to create electron hole pairs. So if alpha e and alpha h travels let us say 1 centimeter of distance in the direction of electric field then the reciprocal of this is basically the value, basically the value of alpha e and alpha h. They are defined as the average number of ionizing collisions per unit length. This we have already seen. If W is the width of region in which avalanche photomultiplication takes place, which could be the width of the depletion region of the photodiode, then alpha E or H into W is the probability of ionizing collisions. So the prob the thing is like we don't know whether an electron produced by the photon will collide and create a new electron hole pair. It can or it cannot. Now how much probable is the hole pair creation? is given by the multiplication of the width of the depletion region and the impact ionization coefficient. So you can relate ionization coefficient in electric field in this by this equation where alpha e is the value of alpha e comma h for e very high value which is of infinity and b and a are arbitrary constants. Similarly you can say threshold ionization energy which is basically the energy which is being lost or transferred when there is a collision occurred as the minimum energy required for impact ionization. And this is given in terms of two equations for electron and this is for hole like this. Okay, Where m star h and m star e are the effective mass of electrons and holes and eg is the band gap energy. Okay. These are the threshold ionization energy. Fine. So I think we have covered a good amount of portion. So please have a look at this slides and let me know if you have any doubts. Thank you.